not top of the day to your lassies and laddies. For those of you out in TV land, it may be a month away from today's date, but today be St. Patty, Patty's Day, the 17th of March. And a great day it is. The sun is shining, faces are beaming, there's smiles all over the place. This is TV Toastmasters, Advanced Club 9523, and it is now called to order. We are located right here in the Anderson Union Cable TV station. We are happy to have you here with us. Toastmasters, it's all about effective communication and leadership skills. And today you'll have an opportunity to see three very good speakers showing you exactly what they have and why they are effective when they communicate. Without wasting any more time, I would like to congratulate a number of people that are here today, people that are guests. We have coming in from all the way out, wait, what state is that again? California. All the way from California, <laughs> Mary Arms, the sister of Sheila Mudd Baker, who you'll be seeing speak later. Come on, give her a round of applause. <laughs> we have Mr. Michael Washington, an advanced communicator silver who will be giving a speech today. Give him a round of applause. And our last guest, Veronica Sanford, a competent communicator, and you'll get a chance to see her speak as well. Give her a round. Now, it's my privilege and honor to introduce to you today, today's Toastmaster, the master of ceremonies as it were. A man who, he's on the verge of becoming a distinguished Toastmaster, the highest rank Toastmasters has to offer. This is a man who, he just oozes Irish genes right out of his pores. <laughs> He's a man who has Irish Alzheimer's. He forgets everything but a grudge. None other than Mr. Steve Aaronholz. Thank you, Mr. President. My, that's a stretch as far as truth in advertising. <laughs> With a name like Aaronholz. <laughs> The only thing that's probably green today is my shirt. <laughs> well, welcome to our Toastmasters meeting in March of 2007, and this show will be broadcast in subsequent months. You'll see it first starting in April. But we're glad to have you here today. I'm glad to have our guests with us. And what I'd like to do at this point is start our meeting off with our first presentation by our word power person, Carol Kormalink, Distinguished Toastmaster. Carol, come up here and give us your word of the day. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and our most welcome guests, and especially our viewing audience at home. The reason we have a word of the day is to increase our vocabulary. And I like to have something. Today is the luck of the Irish day, and lucky. And so I picked a word that is very complimentary to that. It's serendipity. It's a noun, and it's the faculty of making hap happy or interesting discoveries unexpectedly or by accident. For instance, you might say it's serendipity when the farmer was looking for a needle in a haystack and found a blonde instead. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. And as you can see, between the two of us, Carol is also our representative for the wee folk today. <laughs> what we're going to start next is our table topics. Table topics gives us the opportunity to practice impromptu speaking. The participants in table topics are called up to the lectern, and they have the time it takes them to get from their seat up to the lectern as far as preparation is, is concerned. So you can see that this actually represents real life very well. No preparation time. Our table topics master for today is Rita Reese, competent communicator and competent leader. And with that, help me welcome today's table topics master up to the lectern, Rita Reese. Thank you, Rita. Thank you very much, Mr. Need that out of the way for what I'm going to do today. Well, hello, fellow Toastmasters and all the listening audience out there. And like they've said, this is actually St. Patrick's Day. So, as part of my table topics, I thought I'd add a little bit of flavor of St. Patrick's to it. First off, Steve, Steve O'Pitzel, could you come up and be part of our 
uh, table topics. Hi, Steve. I'm ready, respectable, responsible, revealing, relentless, Rita Reese with mm -hmm. Revenue Reporter with Triple R TV. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing an interview on today, today on you. They said that the river might flood. Mm -hmm. And you've got a house right down there by that river. Mm -hmm. And nearly every year you get flooded out. And nearly every year you have to clean up the mess and get back in. Mm -hmm. Why in the world do you want to live that close to the river and have to put up with that every time? Could you tell our audience? Well, probably because um, it's the land of our ancestors. And uh, you don't abandon your, your land because it's the only thing worth fighting for and it's the only thing worth dying for. Thank you very much. <clears throat> My next interview is going to be with Carol Kormlik. <clears throat> Welcome, Carol. I'm ready, responsible, respectful, revealing, relentless, reader, re with Roving Reporter with the Triple R TV. And serendipity has it with you. You found out today that you're having quadruplets. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I thought you were past that. But apparently you and Joe are doing more than kissing the Blarney Stone. How, what are you going to do to handle this? What are your, what are your thoughts about this? Please tell us. Well, Rita, Roving Reporter Relentless, you had one, Two pieces of information. One is a little inaccurate. I am not having quadruplets. My dog is. And I am going to sell these pups, and I'm going to make $1,600 selling these four pups because they are show dogs, and people will want these puppies, and it won't be any sweat off of my, me for having these four quadruplets. <laughs> so... You, did, you were correct that they are in the offing, but it's not me that is going to be delivering them. I will be delivering them to other people as they buy them <laughs> and <laughs> charge them from three to four to five hundred dollars, depending on which one they like the best. And I'm waiting for my one minute green sign here so that I can <laughs> be still. <laughs> okay, here you go, roving reporter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a relief. <laughs> For my next person, I'd like to interview, let's see, what about Steve O. Aronoff? <laughs> Hello, I'm ready, respectable, responsible, revealing, relentless, Rita Reese, Reverend Reporter for Triple R TV. And I understand that you had a harrowing experience last week, that you were up in a hot air balloon with a couple other people enjoying the view, and all of a sudden, it stopped working, and you started going to the ground. The people on the ground were screaming and screaming and screaming, and you were going faster and faster. But the last minute, the, t the operator finally got it under control. You had a rough landing, but what were you thinking when this was going on? Can you tell us what it was like to be in this position? Well, it was quite hair-raising, because as we're plummeting towards Earth, everyone's hair is standing up. You'd think that a gondola full of six people, there'd be plenty of hot air to keep us aloft. But unfortunately, we did not have anywhere near the hot air that we really needed. I was so thankful when the operator for the hot air balloon was able to get that burner going. I told him, I said, I will buy you all the propane you need for the next year and a half. I don't care if you fly every day. but. A few of the people were a little concerned because as we autumn, as we suddenly started going up after having plummet, been plummeting towards Earth, it was a little bit of a jolt, but much less than if we'd actually hit the Earth. So I'll fly in a hot air balloon again, but I need to have a couple of days to decompress before I do that. Thank you, Rita. Thank you very much for that interview. For my last interview, I'd like to ask Mary to come up here. You don't think you can? Uh, no. Okay, Mary's still new. She wants to give a little bit more time. Verna, Verna Gibson, would you like to come up and do this last interview? <laughs> Hello, Verna. Hello. I'm ready, responsible, reliable, relentless, Rita Rees, Reverend Reporter for Triple R TV. And I understand that you won 
the biggest jackpot in the state of Ohio in the lottery. You have $100 million. This is so much money. What in the world are you going to do with all this money? Can you tell us a little bit about what you plan to do? Wow. Well, you know, th this has been uh, just kind of uh, breathtaking, knowing that I've won all this money. A hundred million is, is a lot. And um, I realize I'm going to have to give some of it back to the government. But, um, you know, I have been uh, thinking very seriously about this as to what I'm going to do. There, there's a lot of possibilities. Of course, there's always charity. You know, that, that can work. <laughs> uh, I could give some to my children. That could work. I, I, could, um, I could take a lot of trips, you know, and I think that that's going to be a tops on my agenda is to take, take some trips. But how do you spend $100 million on travel? So, so it's still kind of up in the air. And, um, of course, I can pay off uh, some of my debts, and I, I'm, I, I'm going to buy uh, a few new cars, a couple Ferraris, and, you know, maybe, maybe uh, you know, a Porsche or two, something like that. And... Um, Yes, and it's, <laughs> as I said, it's just breathtaking, and I'm still in the planning stages, and um, I'll let you all know as soon as I find out what I'm going to do with it. Well, thank you very much, Verna. Thank I would you. like to have that problem. <laughs> well, this is it for ready, responsible, respectable, revealing, relentless, read re revving reporter. I'm going to turn this back over to our Toastmaster now. Thank you, Rita. That was quite a collection of table topics that we had this morning. And Rita, that was quite a mouthful you had as far as an introduction. I'm pretty impressed that you were able to keep it straight all the way through. I'd have been switching the words around. Now we're going to get into the prepared speech portion of our meeting. This is where we're going to have the opportunity to hear several speakers give us prepared speeches, each of them focusing on developing certain aspects of their presentation abilities. Our first speaker today will be Sheila Mudd Baker, accomplished Toastmaster Silver and competent leader. She is going to be giving us a presentation from the Persuasive Speaking Manual. This will actually be speech number three. The title of her speech is My Proposal, and her speech duration will be between five and seven minutes. If you'll help me welcome Sheila Mudd Baker up here to give her presentation, my proposal. Thank you, Steve. When we were children, people asked us all the time, what do you want to be when you grow up? Not only did they ask us, sometimes they gave us hints. Would you like to be a doctor, a nurse? a teacher, a librarian, a banker, a firefighter. Of course, as little children, we wanted to be police officers and firefighters. I wanted to be a firefighter because they had spotted dogs, and I thought that was pretty wonderful. I didn't understand what a firefighter was. As I grew older, I started to change my ideas about what I wanted. Well, the United States of America is much like a child. We're not all that old. Back when we first became a country, all we wanted was to be left alone, except for an occasional foray into Canada where we thought we might pick up a little extra territory and we're not successful. It's like a child's game back in this, the late 1700s. But for the most part at the beginning, we was just wanted to have roads and safety and good health for our citizens and we wanted all of our neighbors and all of the world to leave us alone unless they wanted to do business with us. As the years went by, just as a young person changes their mind about what they want to be when they grow up and changes the direction that he or she would want to go, our country made changes too. Here is a proposal for all of us. What do we want to be as a country when we grow up? We're just barely over 200 years old. In terms of countries, we're still pretty much a baby. We're trying to decide what we want to be. We're a little beyond adolescence. We're old enough now that we would be considered able to make decisions about a long-term future. When we're children, we make decisions based on glamour. I want to be a firefighter. We end up being a mortician or an insurance agent or 
uh, an office worker, which is not as glamorous, but it serves our needs at the time. When we are a country, a country starts at a certain point and it progresses over the years to become what it does become. Many of us are not always happy about the way our country is going. And other countries, such as Ireland, have made major decisions about changing the direction of their country. For example, in Ireland, there was a seven-year planning process involving every citizen in the country in which the churches, the governments, the businesses, the schools, everyone got together to plan a future that worked for Ireland. They took Ireland from a third world country to a first world country in seven years. America has a similar process, but we don't always think about it. Town meetings. When we first started as a country, we had town meetings. And in town meetings, we would decide how a town would go or how a state would go. But these days, the only people who have town meetings, Vermont. No one else has it, but it's time for a national town meeting. My proposal is that every town in the United States have town meetings, a series of town meetings over the next couple of years to decide what direction do we want to go? Who do we want to be? And if we don't make those decisions for ourselves as a group, someone else is going to make them for us. It can be the economic market, it can be the political environment, it can be the world deciding to block us out or, or change the way that they deal with us. We must make a national political decision on what we're going to be doing for the next 50 years. If we don't do it now, someone else will do it for us. So on the St. Patrick's Day, I believe that we should consider the, the Irish model, which is everyone in the country who could possibly help make a decision needs to voice their opinion. First at the very, very local basis, that might be a neighborhood level, and a city basis, on a state basis, on a national <coughs> basis, until there is consensus about where our country is going. Do we want to grow? Do we want to take in Puerto Rico as a state? Do we want to drop certain countries as our friends? Do we want to add certain countries as our friends? Do we want to change our educational system? What is it we want from the long term? Do we want to be the friend of all or the police officer of all the, of the world? What do we want? So if we really care about what happens to the future, to the generations that are coming behind us, now is the time to involve those young children as early as six years old, the teenagers, the people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, all the way up past their hundreds, involve every single person in America and start thinking about where we want to go, what we're going to do, because I think it's time that we grow up. America, let's get going. Mr. Toastmaster. Our next speaker that we have, and we are privileged to have one of our guests today giving us a presentation. Veronica Sanford is a member of the Fifth Third Madisonville Toastmasters. Veronica is a competent Toastmaster. She is going to be giving us a speech that comes from the storytelling manual, and those are always fun. Her speech will be four to six minutes in length, and the title of her speech that we will hear today is called The Future. Help me welcome Veronica Sanford. Welcome, Veronica. Welcome, fellow Toastmasters, honored guests, and our viewing audience. My first memory is of my dad playing with all of us, six children, in our living room. And I, being the youngest, decided to go back into our back bedroom closet and hide. Had I been the oldest or the only child, my dad would have come and found me. I know that. But instead, I waited and I waited and I waited and it seemed like an eternity. And I knew he wasn't coming. I was abandoned. And I came out of that back bedroom closet 
And I looked at my dad. And I looked at him playing with the other five kids. And I knew that very likely he didn't even notice that I was gone. I was crushed. I was heartbroken. What I decided at that moment is I was going to be a competitor. I was going to stand out. And ever since that day, I've been competitive with my classmates, with my family members, with everyone. I was always the first to raise my hand in school. It's made me successful, and I'm not sorry for that. The other ha thing that happened when I was very young is my mom was driving the six of us somewhere, I don't remember where, in a Woody in a station wagon. And my younger brother, actually he was my second brother, but he was still older than me, was mouthing off. He was a joker, and he was mouthing off at my mom. And she stopped the car. She pulled over. She had him get, get out, and she drove away. What that taught me, I was four, and I was petrified. I said, I don't want my mom doing that to me. So I learned at that moment that I was going to be nice. I'd better be nice, because you never know what happens. People can take unexpected behavior if you're not nice. I want to let you know that I know now that my mom and dad love me very much, without a doubt. My dad probably thought, she's okay, she probably went to the bathroom, she can take care of herself. And it was true, I could take care of it myself, and I always have. And my mom, six kids, a 10-year-old boy, how else are you going to teach him the lesson that he can't keep mouthing off to his mom? Nothing bad there. But what I want to say to you is that we all have choices. We have choices about what we do in our day-to-day -day behavior, and children make decisions about who we are and who they are based upon our behavior. But we also have a choice. We have a choice of decoupling our story about what happened and what actually happened and possibly take a different interpretation. Through communication, we can find out what did that person really mean when they did that. Now my mom and dad have passed away and I'm an orphan now, but I know that they love me very much. And I also think that if we look at who we are being in our lives, not what we have. It's a complete reversal of what we normally think. Normally we think, if I do this, then I will have these things, then I will be happy. But instead, consider the possibility that I could be happy, and I could do these things, and then I could have these things. But regardless of whether or not I have these things or not, I'm still going to be happy. So what I'd like to do is say that right now, I know where my past is, and I know who I am right now. I'm evolving. I'm not who I am going to be 10 years from now, God willing. But I also say our future is completely undetermined. <coughs> we can almost choose our future and live into it instead of having our past determine who we will be in our future. Our third speech today will be given by another guest that we are fortunate to have with us this morning. Michael Washington, accomplished Toastmaster Silver and competent leader, will be giving us a speech that comes from the Persuasive Speech Manual. This is the, actually, I, excuse me, it's the Persuasive Speech from the Public Relations Manual. And the setting for his speech is in front of an audience of 500 high school students. Talk about chaos. This is in an auditorium, which furthers chaos. <laughs> but his message is focused on the students staying in school, completing high school, and after graduation, going to college. His speech is entitled, You Can Too. Help me welcome Michael Washington. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Good afternoon, fellow Toastmasters and guests. Other 
day I had a chance to talk with my auntie. And we had a chance to get caught up on past events. She was telling me a story about her son. One day she woke up, she walked into his room, walked over toward the bed, nudged him on his shoulder. Wake up, son. It's time for school. Wake up. And she walked out of the room and headed toward the staircase. And she noticed he hadn't got out of bed, so she turned around and looked in the room and decided to go back in. Walked over toward the bed. Wake up, son. It's time for school. Let's go. So our son sits up in bed. He turns to her and says, Mom, I'm not going to school. She said, why not? Because there's over 100 teachers, 100 administrators, 1,000 students at that school, and I've been trying to think of one that likes me. She says, well, I understand how you feel, son, but that's not a good reason to avoid school today. So he said, Mom, you heard what I just told you. Why should I even go? She says, I'll tell you two reasons why. One, you're 45 years old. <laughs> and two, you're the principal of the freaking school. <laughs> so come on, let's go, son. <laughs> Folks, does everything in life happen to you, or do we make it happen? Picture this. Normally there's a lot of things pulling at you. There's a lot of things pushing you, such as your parents, you have your teachers, you have homework, you have tests you have to take, you even have pop quizzes. And you're on your way to school, and you're thinking about all the things you need to take care of for the day. And you recall you have a quiz you have to take. So you go into the room, you take the quiz, after the quiz is over, you walk out of the room, not really sure how well you did on your quiz. Obviously, you get a text message from your friends. You read the text message, it says, show up in the gym after school. Finding the last bell rings, you go to the gym, and there are your friends. You walk up toward them, they're standing there, and they say to you, you are not down no more. You are no longer part of the group. We are cutting you off. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's tough. How do you deal with that? So before you can ask them what happened, they all walk away. So you head home. You explain everything to your dad. And your dad knows that's tough. He knows that sucks. But being the type of dad that he is, he tells you. Pull yourself together. Come on, pull yourself together, son. Because in life, there's all types of rejection. There's all types of frustration. There's all types of pressures. But you've got to handle those obstacles. You've got to face your challenges. Because these things will build your character. These things will help you to be the type of person you're going to become. So you take all this advice, you go back to your friends, and you're hoping, and you're hoping that they're going to take you back. But what happens? Maybe, or maybe not. So now you have a, an important choice to make. You can take control of your life. And by taking control of your life, you can find some new friends. Friends who would accept you and appreciate you just the way you are. So you can focus on the things that you need to focus on. And after doing that, some time will go by, a month will go by, years will go by. You're making progress. Things are going great. Your grades have gotten better. Finally, you graduate from high school, and then you go on to college. Isn't that a time of celebration? You have finally made it. Now, some of you may be thinking, if you even care, can this really happen to me? <coughs> and I'm standing here today to tell you that it can, because the exact same thing happened to me. 
It happened to me, folks. My reason for being here today is to get you thinking more seriously about what you can do, to get you thinking more seriously about what's important for all of you. Because one day, I did. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Michael. A part of every Toastmasters meeting is evaluation. We not only practice our speaking skills, we also have the opportunity to get feedback. And this feedback will take the form of telling us what we have done well, what we have been successful at, as well as giving us insight into what we might want to do a bit differently, maybe a growth area that we are looking at developing so that we become a more well-rounded speaker. At this point, I will hand our, our meeting over to the general evaluator today, and our general evaluator will be Gary Reese. I want to let you know that Gary is not only our club president, but he just recently completed his advanced communicator gold level, and he's also a competent leader. Help me welcome Gary Reese as our general evaluator. One of the greatest things about Toastmasters International is we give you instantaneous feedback. Not only did you just get up here and do something, but we get right off the bat and tell you what it was you did, how well you did it, what could have used some help. We explain to you a better way to possibly do it, another way to consider it. And we also give you all kinds of reinforcement on you really did a good job on the way that you did do it. Today, to help us evaluate our speakers, we have evaluating for Sheila Mudd Baker, our ATM, t ATM Silver, none other than Miss Verna Gibson. Come on, Verna. Thank you, Gary. <clears throat> Sheila, I really enjoyed your speech, your proposal. It was so good. It's so well organized. I think it's one of the one of your very best. It was absolutely terrific. The proposal's objective, as I see it, was what do we want to be as a country when we grow up? If our leaders do not know our history, if they don't read history, they don't think about what has happened in the past, well, we are going to repeat those mistakes, obviously. If we fail to plan, we plan to fail, and I, I have a uh, feeling that many of our leaders are going in that direction, unfortunately. So, um, but as a country, we need to grow up. We need to plan ahead, think about what we want to be in the future. This is a great proposal. Sheila has proposed that every town in this country should have town meetings. She said that, that um, Ireland operates under this uh, if I understood that right, that Ireland ha at least has used this in the past. And I'm sorry that I, I might have missed a little bit of that. But I know that you said that, that Vermont actually still practices town meetings. Sheila says that every citizen in this country should have a voice. It should be required to voice their opinion. And I think that this is very important. I believe that as a country, the, the citizens of this country are definitely feeling disenfranchised and that our voices no longer count. So this is a, a very important proposal and I hope that it will go to the highest levels of government or that our new leaders, as we go into our elections, that our new leaders will look at this. This obviously was um, directed towards the audience and it's something that the audience needs to hear. It's something that we can all think about. If we are citizens of this country, then we, we need to be able to voice our opinions. It's just like uh, planning our own future or planning for the future of our children. The con our country needs to plan for its future also. Sheila says that if we don't decide, someone else will. We must plan long term. If you fail again, and this is my words, I don't believe Sheila used these words, but I'm paraphrasing what Sheila was probably saying, that if we fail to plan, we plan to fail. She had a very well organized 
and logical proposal. She had a good opening with humor, which I also enjoyed. Uh, she had some interesting facts and a very good wrap up. And again, she threw in some humor throughout her proposal and that helped to also uh, keep our attention and it's a way that we can relate it to ourselves at times. Her delivery was very good. Her enunciation choice of words was, was excellent. Sheila had good eye contact. How could Sheila improve her proposal? Well, the only thing that I could think of, I think the delivery and what Sheila had to say was excellent. The only thing I might think is perhaps you could um, include some charts or graphs or uh, maybe a few more numbers or facts that would back up your information. But all in all, this is an excellent proposal and I hope that as I said, I hope that it will be heard at the highest levels of government. Good job, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you, Verna. Ordinarily, a speaker would only have that role for a particular meeting, speaker, because that's something that you have to really focus on and prepare for and be ready with. But today, we were fortunate enough to have Michael Washington here who graciously, in the true spirit of Toastmasters, not only was a speaker, but also doubled up as an evaluator for our next speaker, Veronica Sanford. So please give me a warm welcome for Mr. Michael Washington. Well, folks, Veronica, she did a fantastic job on her speech. Uh, she had it way, uh, well laid out about the story, the main points that was inside the story. It was logical, and it flowed nice and smooth from one idea to the next. So I really enjoyed the beginning portion all the way to the end of your speech. Um, some of the things that captured and held our interest, I believe, was she had a warm and, and pleasant smile. That just kind of pulled me in. So I really like that part about you and, and you know, don't give up that smile. <laughs> so she personalized the story because it tied into something that happened with her and her dad. So I thought you did a great job with that and it left a pretty positive impression on what she wants to do later on down the road as far as <coughs> being an ambitious, competitive type of person. So those are some of the things she's going to strive for. <coughs> and to add to her message and keep us connected, she had excellent eye contact. So I really like that part. Plus, she intensified you know, her speech by, again, highlighting the main points in the beginning, in the middle, and tied it into the end by addressing it to other people on what they can do with their lives now and down the road. So congratulations on your speech and keep up the good work. Our next evaluator is a bon vivant, a man about town, a man who's a Loop Division governor and my job up here is to make him feel welcome. So I will have the pleasure and distinct honor of welcoming Mr. Gary Reese up here to the lectern. <laughs> <laughs> Guests, Toastmasters, and especially Mr. Michael Washington, you can too. I wondered what the title was about and then it hit me during the course of your presentation. I did it and you can too. It's not serendipitous that I was asked to evaluate your particular presentation today. Because uh, as a motivational speaker, I talk quite a bit about having character, integrity, being dependable, reliable, responsible, that your, co that your decisions ultimately have consequences and repercussions, be they positive or be they negative. And you pretty much captured that today with your presentation about the uh, alternatives to what will happen if you're not careful. Or if you are careful, then good things will happen as well. How convincing was the speaker's argument on his or her viewpoint? I thought it was good. You showed nice compare and contrast on life choices, life decisions. There are consequences and repercussions. How effective was the speaker's emotional appeal? You used a combination of love withdrawal versus achievement. Here's the, here's the, the, the whip, here's the carrot. I liked it. How closely did the presentation relate to the audience's interests? For a room full of students or a auditorium full of students, I thought this would have hit home powerfully for them. For me, I've already made these life decisions, so you didn't really convince me to change my opinion, but as a student, I probably would have. Comment on the smoothness and effectiveness of the talk. I thought the joke was appropriate at the very beginning. The only problem was the segue between the joke 
and the transition into the body of your speech was a little rough. You might have been able to tie it together a little better by saying, and now let me tell you children, the very same thing that happened to that principal with his mother could happen to you very soon. As an example, it needed a little bit of tying and interweaving together, some stitches to pull it together. How did the visual aid contribute to the speaker's per persuasive effort? This is my one large question mark. In this, in this particular presentation, you were supposed to use at least one visual aid to help us drive home the point. I didn't see a visual aid, so I don't know where that was. It was lacking. Always read the book, read the manual, and pound home the objectives. And I'd also like to say, that, well, I'll say that as my, my general evaluator marks later. How persuasive with the speech? On a 1 to 10 scale, I gave you a 7. I thought you used an excellent metaphor. It happened to me. It could happen to you, too. Did the speaker change your opinion and how? Again, I was already in agreement, but have, were I a student, I probably would have had to agree with you. What else might the speaker have done to convince you? I think I would have pounded home the issues of character, integrity, moral, ethics, that if you build your character, if you say, if you do what you say you're going to do, you start something and you finish it and you give 100% to get there, that people will respect you instead of fear you and that you will accomplish things in life that will make you a success. This is an example of what I think you could have done to pound it home just a little bit more forcefully. Again, this was a great presentation. I look forward to hearing your next one. Thank you very much. Now it's my duty, obligation, and privilege to give the general evaluator's report. And this is where I get to explain what my opinion was of the entire meeting up to this point. Everyone who's been to the lectern at this point, I'm going to tell you what all you did, how well you did it, and what you could have done to do it better. <laughs> now you like that for grammar. <laughs> the meeting opened up on time. Uh, it has no choice. It's on TV. <laughs> The president opened up with energy and enthusiasm. That was me. <laughs> the Toastmaster, Steve Ehrenholtz, you were vibrant. You gave us a few segues that, that, that were nice little pieces of tidbits that introduced each person going on and coming off as well. Good job. The word of the day, Carol. It was not kismet. It was not chance. It was not luck. It was not fate. It was serendipity. <laughs> Good word. Good word. Not all used nearly often enough. Table topics. We had... Our ravishing, relentless reporting, Rita Reese. Great job, as always. I love the way that you injected enthusiasm into your questions and you got the audience going. You made them think. You gave them uh, situations that they had no idea that were coming. This is the idea of impromptu speaking. It's an exercise to see how well you think on your feet when asked a question. Boom. Can you form it into an opening, a body, and a conclusion within a matter of a minute to two minutes? Great job. I would like to also say on the table topics, Carol, while you were giving your answer, you said, if we had four quadruplets. Now, I don't know if that's redundant or if you're actually having 16 puppies. <laughs> <laughs> Verna, you were asked about if you won all that money, what would you do? And you said you'd like to give it to charity. For point of information, my middle name is Charity. <laughs> Okay, this is, this is a, a suggestion to help improve our meetings. And this is no fault of Steve's as the Toastmaster. This is actually a lack of, of discipline on our part as a club. One of the things we need to do is we need to always tell the audience, especially those out there in the viewing audience, what the objectives are of each speech. Because ordinarily in most clubs, we would have the evaluator get up and explain that. Because of, because of the constraints we have here in the studio, the, the Toastmaster is gonna be the one that needs to do that. What exactly are we looking for before this person gets up and gives the presentation? Very important. Hopefully we'll make notes on that and we'll make changes so that Toastmasters in the future will address that. I did notice that Steve did, did cover part of, part of the objectives for Steve's presentation, but we, I think we missed it on Veronica's and we missed it on Sheila Mudd Baker's. These are important aspects that we need to cover. Yeah, I Sheila, <laughs> serendipitous, my proposal. You know, when you stand up here at the lectern, you look exactly like a college professor. You have, you have the ability to automatically just, just ooze PhD credentials out your pores. <laughs> you look like an authority figure. When you say something, it's like, and that's the way it is. Veronica, you have a childlike natural sincerity that just comes forth. And it's like, 
I know that whether or not what you're saying is accurate or not, I know you believe it. And that's, that's important. As they say in politics, the key to winning any election is sincerity. And once you learn to fake that, you've got it licked. <laughs> and Michael, I've already given your evaluation on UCAN too. I'd like to congratulate my timer and my grammarian and word of the day and, and uh, eye counter. They both did an excellent job. I think this uh, particular meeting was, was well run. The presentations were excellent. And uh, we had quite a crowd of turnout today. I'd like to thank our director, Mr. Michael Schaefer. I'd like to thank our cameraman, Mr. Stephen Pelzel. Both of you did a fantastic job. And with that, I'll call up our Toastmaster of the Day to close out the meeting, Mr. Steve Aaronholz. Thank you, Mr. General Evaluator and Mr. President. And I know you didn't really mean to rename Michael as Steve. We'd have three Steves. <laughs> Stephen, Stephen, Michael, and I go by Steve or Stephen. That's what we call him in the hood. Oh. <laughs> As Gary mentioned, we had a great meeting today. We had a really nice slate of presentations. We had an enthusiastic table topics master today. We had insightful evaluations. And I would like to encourage all of you and those of you in our viewing audience to come and visit us or check out another Toastmasters Club. We can be found all over the Cincinnati area, or you can look us up on the internet at www.toastmasters.org, and feel free to come and visit us. You want to come back up? Yeah, one last thing. With that, I'm going to turn it back to our club president to close out the meeting. Thank you. I was almost remiss. I forgot. April 14th, it's a Saturday. Mark it down on your calendars. April 14th, Saturday. 9 a.m. till approximately 3 p.m. The University of Cincinnati's College of Law. It's at the corner of Calhoun and I want to say <coughs> Clifton. Corner of Calhoun and Clifton. Thank you very much. See, you're like a PhD. <coughs> <laughs> there will be a division, dual division, International Speech Contest and International Evaluation Contest. You don't want to miss this. These are the best speakers in the entire division all around Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky. They will all be coming together and battling it out head-to-head -head competition. They can possibly go on to the district, the winner will, then on to the, to the region, and then on to the international to be, con to be crowned as the world champion of public speaking. This is your opportunity. It's free. There'll be a free breakfast. There'll be a free lunch. Come. You will see signs all over the place. Just get to the College of Law. There will be people around and signs showing you which room to go to. 9 o'clock, Saturday morning, April 14th. You don't want to miss it. For those of you out there in TV land, this is your opportunity to see what Toastmasters is all about. Thank you very much for joining us today. And with that, we adjourn Toastmasters Advanced Club TV right now. Thank you.